I assume all of you can read and write. We have the fortune to be literate. We internet users blog, chat, and surf. And the next truth is just a click away. But knowing how to read and write isn't enough in our high-tech society. What we also need is risk literacy. Without it, we jeopardize our health and money. And as we will see, without it, our emotions can be easily manipulated and remote controlled. In fact, they already are. In this talk, I'd like to invite you into the world of risk, beginning with a very humble hazard, getting soaked. A TV newscaster in the US once announced the weather this way. The probability that it will rain on Saturday is 50%. The probability that it will rain on Sunday is also 50%. Therefore, he concluded, chances that it will rain on the weekend are 100%. <laughs> Most of us smile at that. Huh? But do you know what it means if the weather report announces a 30% chance of rain tomorrow? 30% of what? I live in Berlin. Most Berliners think it will rain tomorrow in 30% of the time, that is, <laughs> seven to eight hours. Others think it will rain tomorrow in 30% of the region, that is most likely not where they live. <laughs> most New Yorkers think both are nonsense. It means that it will rain on 30% of the days for which this prediction has been made. That is, most likely there will be no rain at all tomorrow. How come this confusion? Part of the problem is, or are, experts who have never learned to explain probabilities to the public here, who cannot spell out to what class chances of rain refer. Time, region, days, what meteorologists want to say is that it will rain on 30% of the days for which the prediction has been made. But people left on their own, they invent a class that makes sense to them. And more imaginative minds can even think of others. A woman in New York said, I know what a 30% chance means. Three meteorologists think it rains and seven not. <laughs> There is a simple remedy to this confusion. Always ask, percentage of what? Getting soaked is a minor risk, but do we understand risk better when something really important is at stake? Besides tea and scones and the queen, Great Britain has some less comfortable traditions. One of them is the contraceptive pill scare. Since the 1960s, women are alarmed every couple of years by reports that the pill causes thrombosis, that is, potentially life-threatening blood clots in the legs or lung. In the most famous scare, the UK Committee on Safety of Medicines and the Press uh, issued a warning that women who take the third generation pill increase their risk of a thrombosis twofold, that is, by 100%. 100%. How much more certain can you be? <laughs> Many distressed women stopped taking the pill, which led to unwanted pregnancies and abortions. Just how much is 100%? The studies on which the warning was based showed that out of every 7,000 women who took the previous generation pill, one had a thrombosis, which increased to two among those who took the third generation pill. That is, the absolute risk increase was only one in 7,000. 
But that can be phrased in the frightening 100%. Yeah. If the media would have reported the absolute risk, then very few women would have panicked and stopped taking the pill. Most likely, nobody would have even cared. This single scare led to an estimated 13,000 abortions, additional abortions in England and Wales, and many teenage pregnancies. The problem here is not better pills, but more risk-savvy young women and men. It shouldn't be so difficult to explain to a teenager the difference between a relative risk, 100% scary, and an absolute risk, 1 in 7,000. So, there is a simple rule that helps here to stop these scares, namely, always ask for the absolute risk. The fact or the use of relative risks and similar strategies to mislead the public is quite common in screening uh, brochures, in medical advertisement, in the media in general. The misuse of information and misleading the public should be at the agenda of every governmental ethics committee. It is not. You might think that risk literacy is already taught in every high school, medical school, law school, etc. No. These principles aren't taught. But there is a solution to that, as I hinted. We could easily change this by teaching some simple principles that are easy to learn. Most of us remember exactly where we were on September 11, 2001. And few of us, if any, have forgotten the images of the planes crashing into the twin towers of the World Trade Center. Governments reacted with better technology, such as uh, full-body scanners, with more bureaucracy, such as homeland security, and with further limitations of our individual freedom. Everything seems to be said after the 9-11 Commission report, but the only measure the report did not pay attention to was risk-savvy citizens. Let's turn the clock back to December 2001. Imagine you live in New York. You want to travel to Washington. Would you fly or drive? <coughs> we know that many Americans stopped flying after 9-11. Did they stay home or did they jump in their car? I looked into the transportation statistics and what you find is that for 12 months, the number of miles driven on the roads increased substantially. And particularly there, where long distance drive, driving is being done. And in these 12 months, an estimated 1,600 Americans lost their lives on the road by driving rather than flying. Every one of these 1,600 people could be still alive. There was no single passenger death in the next year and the following years at U.S. commercial flights. Terrorists strike twice. The first strike is a physical assault, but it's followed by a second strike, which uses our brains, our fear. And if anything like 9-11 should happen again, we should not let terrorists have their second strike. What is the brain psychology the terrorists exploit? It appears to be a simple unconscious rule. If many people die at one point in time, react with fear and avoid the situation. Note, the fear is not about dying per se. If an equal number or more people die distributed over the year, as in car accidents or cigarette smoking, it's very difficult to make us afraid. 
what we seem to fear is to die suddenly together with lots of others. <laughs> we dread the rare nuclear power plant accident, but not the continuous death toll caused by pollution from coal power plants. We dreaded the swine flu pandemic that never occurred. But few of us are concerned about being among the 10,000 every year who die from the regular flu. Let's come back to my question. Assume you live in New York, you want to travel to Washington, you have only one goal, which is arrive alive. <laughs> question, how many miles would you have to drive by car until the risk of dying is the same as in a non-stop flight? I've asked this question to many audiences. And the answers are all over the place. 1,000 miles, 10,000 miles, three times around the world. The best answer is 12 miles. Yes, only 12. That is, if your car arrives safely at the airport, <laughs> the most dangerous part of your trip is probably already behind you. <laughs> are people hopeless when it comes to risk? Some of my colleagues think that we are predictably irrational, victims of our cognitive illusions, and in dire need to be nudged to behave properly from birth to death. Collect the experts, close the doors, and then tell the public what they should do. This is not my vision. People aren't born stupid. We can teach every child to become risk literate if we only start to change the way we teach. It's time for a change. At the Max Planck Institute for Human Development, we design tools with which even fourth graders can solve so-called Bayesian problems that stump most adults and most doctors and lawyers including. And we can even do more. Schools could teach a new generation to become risk savvy, to deal intelligently yeah, with the risk and the chances that critically affect their lives. And we could do even more spectacular things. Think about one of the most frightening health threats, cancer. Billions have been spent on screening and cancer drugs. Mostly, with a few exceptions, with limited success. But about half of all cancers are due to behavior, to smoking, to a couch potato lifestyle, lack of physical activity, obesity, uh, alcohol abuse. We could prevent these cancers. But there's no point telling a 15-year-old to stop smoking because he wouldn't listen. Habits are formed early, and we need to start already before puberty. And we should not moralize. We should make young people competent so that they can make independent and informed decisions whether we like these or not. Here is my bet. If we would spend half of the amount that goes into cancer research on making young people risk literate, we would save more lives from cancer than by spending the same amount on the next generation of cancer drugs. And the skills young people learn, they would not only make them more healthy in general, but they would empower them to take control over their lives rather than being remote controlled by digital media, greedy banks, or manipulative advertisement. <laughs> and, <laughs> we could do that. 
Think about who would have thought a few hundred years ago that so many people on earth can learn how to read and write. Today, many find it equally implausible that people could become risk literate. I'm one of the few who think otherwise, and I encourage you to do the same. Everyone can learn to deal with risk and uncertainty. Everyone who dares to know.